I'm going to preach a message today titled Happily Ever After. And before I do, I'm going to pray. Would you bear with me? God, thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of relationships, the gift of friendships, the gift of marriage. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us today, whether we're single, whether we're married. God, we pray that you would speak to us, encourage us, teach us, train us, equip us. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say... Amen. All I know is our worship team smashed it today. I mean, they absolutely crushed it today. Happily ever after. Happily ever after. I, I think, you know, if, if it comes right down to it, we all want to be happy. Right? I mean, nobody wakes up and is like, man, I hope today is a living hell. Nobody wakes up like, dear God, please let today be absolutely miserable. Like, we all want to be happy. I want to be individually happy as a, as a human. I want to be happy. And I think we want to be happy in our friendships. We want to be happy in our relationships and happy in our marriages. The problem is, is that from what statistics say and from what studies show and from what I have learned over 30 years in full-time ministry is that marriages don't just automatically fall into the happily ever after category. Marriages don't fall into happily ever after by default. They, they, they take incredible amounts of work. They take incredible amounts of attention. The reality is, and if you're single here today, uh, I'd like to enlighten you that marriages are tough. And there's no real happily ever after marriages without, without God being the centerpiece. And even when God is the centerpiece, it's still not easy. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot a lot of humility. It takes a lot of forgiveness. When I was a young man and we had our second child, I decided to buy a minivan. That's right, minivan dad. And I remember I was buying a used minivan and this gentleman that I bought it from, he was telling me that he'd been married for 60 plus years and I was like, bro, that's crazy. Like. What, what is the key to being married that long? And without any delay, he said, short-term memory. <laughs> and I thought, man, that's good. It takes a lot of forgiveness, but it, it really must be built on the foundation of God and God's word. And so I want to read this verse again to you because if you want a happily ever after marriage, it has to be built on Psalm 121, 127, verse 1. And it says, unless the Lord builds the house. Let's read it together. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So what does that mean? It means that if you want a marriage that is happily ever after, you've, you've got to build it God's way. Not your way. Not their way, not the world's way, but God's way. It, it, it means that you need to let God build it, right? And so if I build my life upon the ideals of God's word, the principles of God's word, the values and the morals of God's holy word, and then I meet somebody that's doing the exact same thing, we got a good running start. We got a good running start because you have two like-minded people that are equally yoked, chasing after the same things. So I've got to build my life, build my marriage, build my family on the foundation of God's word. So the Bible teaches us that marriage is sacred. The world doesn't teach us marriage is sacred. Culture doesn't teach us that marriage is sacred. But God's word teaches that marriage is sacred. In fact, that God 
designed marriage. Marriage was God's idea. Marriage was God's idea. So a, a happily ever after marriage, it must be built on prayer, worship, scripture, church, being a part of a church family. And there are no fairy tale ma- marriages. For everybody, you know, you're single and you're just like, oh man, just, you can just skip the old man part. Because there's no fairy tale messages, uh, marriages. There's no perfect marriages because there's no perfect human. Right? So we have to understand that marriage is two imperfect people coming together and, try, and trying to do life together. So they take a lot of work. They take a, lo- they take a lot of attention, a lot of a lot of effort. Listen, I I wanna be so careful when I teach on marriage because sometimes you you might be going through marriage problems or you might have gone through a divorce or maybe you've gone through two divorces or you you say, man, this has been horrible. And and I wanna be careful because I don't don't want you to look at me and Natalie and think like, man, if I only had that. Because you can be pastors in ministry, and I'm just here to tell you, real talk is marriages take work. They take a lot of work. They take a lot of humility in laying down your life. In fact, they demand selflessness. They demand sacrifice. Right? They demand humility, demand forgiveness, and, 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 they, and then take all of these things and you've got to do them over and over and over and over. And over. it'd be one thing if you had to be humble once. It'd be one thing if you had to ask for forgiveness once. It'd be one thing if you had to forgive once. No, it takes these concepts over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so every relationship needs to be built on God's love, right? What is God's love? Jesus, he said this in John chapter 15, verse 13. You've probably heard this verse. He said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. So, hey, listen, if you want a romantic verse about marriage, there it is. There's the romantic verse. There's no greater love than to lay your life down for your wife, than to lay your life down for your husband. And so the Bible talks extensively about love, right? In fact, there's an entire chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and we call it the love chapter. I'm so grateful for what the Bible says about love because it also, it tells us what love is, but it also tells us what love is not, right? So, so, so let's read these verses here in 1 Corinthians 13, verses four through eight. We'll read them out loud together. Ready, here we go. Love is patient, love is kind does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs, parentheses, women, on parentheses. (laughs) Verse six, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So if you want, and, and, and I came, I'm not, I didn't come to, you know, preach or anything today. I, I came to teach on the principles of God's word about love and relationship and, and especially marriage today. So this passage, it, it teaches us 16 things about love. It teaches us, it gives us 16 things about what love is, but also about what love is not, right? I mean, that, that's, that passage is talking about God's love, not human love. We need human love to rise up and align with God's love. 
Because human love is radically different because we are sin-filled and sinful by nature. So I want to talk about what the word says about love. Hey, hey, not what the world says about love. Because those don't line up. See, God's word shows us what love looks like. But the world shows us what lust looks like. Right? Hollywood, media, music. The world shows us what lust looks like. Happily ever after is we watch a movie and we see somebody fall into love and then the movie's over. That's, that's a happy beginning. That's, we don't watch movies that are happily ever after. We don't listen to songs that are about love and giving your life away. We listen to songs about sex and lust, right? So the world promotes lust, but God's word, it promotes love. And there's a big difference between love and lust Two radically concepts because love is patient, but lust is impatient, right? Love is, is farsighted where lust is nearsighted. Lust is selfish and love is selfless. Lust is, is cheap and love will cost you everything you've got. Love is, love is committed and lust is not committed. So the real interesting part of falling in love, that's really not love. That is infatuation, right? And I catch feelings, and man, those feelings are powerful, and they are. God created us that way. There's nothing wrong about that, but that is not love. That is a feeling, and love is not a feeling Love is faithfulness. Love is not fleeting. Love is forever. So I've decided I don't have enough time today to break all this down. So I'm going to continue this again next Sunday. But I do want to talk about, for a few moments, about four things if you want a marriage that's happily ever after. Four keys to a marriage that's happily ever after. So number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down, is you need to keep that flame flaming. Yeah. Somebody say the word keep. Let's say it out loud. Keep. Okay, okay. On the count of three, shout it. One, two, three. Keep. Four things we need to keep Four things we need to continue doing because we start out doing them. When you fall in love, when you become infatuated, when you catch feelings, you, you're doing these things already. And you need to keep, you need to keep doing these things. So number one is keep that flame flaming. You know, I... Marriage is interesting. If you've been married for any length of time, marriage has seasons, right? Pastor Darrison last week's like, we've been married seven years, and to him that probably seems like a long time. <laughs> you know, my wife and I were coming up on 27 years. To me, that, that seems like a long time. For some of you, that you're like, man, that... That's pretty good, but I'm at 50. Anybody in here been married 50 years or, or more? Stand up. If you've married 50 years or more, stand up for just a minute. Come on. These are, these are, these are our superheroes right here. Congratulations. Thank you guys for standing up. Next week, you're preaching this sermon. I'm going to sit in the front row with my notepad. But keep the fan flaming and don't let the flame go out. Because here's what happens. We meet somebody, we're in love, and man, that fire is firing. You know what I'm saying? But just like if you were to start a campfire, you start it and it's going well. It's nice and hot. The flames are big. It's strong. And you leave it if you don't tend 
to that campfire, the flames start to go out. If you don't continue to focus on the fire in your life, the flame starts to go out. You have to give it attention. You got to fan the flame. You got to add more logs to to, to the fire. The the Bible says in Proverbs 5, it says this. In in verse 19, it says, let your mate's affection fill you at all times with delight. Okay, hold on now. Gosh, there's so much to talk about. Let your, whose affection? Whose? Your co-workers? (laughs) <laughs> he says, let your mate's affection, and then what's he say? Fill you, fill you at all times with delight. So let their affection fill you and let your affection fill them. Let their affection fill you and let your affection fill them. Now, that word delight, that word delight, I, I, wanna, I wanna focus in on that for a minute. Because that word delight right here is one of the strongest words in the entire Hebrew language. It literally means this. It means to be intoxicated, to be ravished, to be enthralled, to be exhilarated, to be mind blown because of your mate, your spouse, your wife, your husband. Let your mate's affection fill you at all times with delight. At all times, I want to be like intoxicated because of you. I want to be absolutely ravished, enthralled because of you. And and so this, this is natural at the beginning. This is natural at the beginning. And, And so for everybody in here that you're not yet married, that's the power of catching feelings because it's natural at the beginning. And if you're not fanning the flame of your own marriage, of your own relationship, the devil's gonna throw some other fires in front of you, right? And so he says, let let that affection, your mate's affection, fill you, fill you. Hey, listen, romance is easy at the beginning. (laughs) romance is easy at the beginning because you're love drunk yeah you are you 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 are intoxicated when you're when you are infatuated I don't know how else to say it you've lost your mind when you're infatuated you do things that you have never done before in your life when you're infatuated you do things that are crazy When you are infatuated, you caught feelings. Everybody around you who knows you, they're looking at you like you've lost your mind. You don't think you have. You think it's normal what you're, but like we're looking at you and we're like, ew, like that's gross, dude. But you're like, oh, I got, I got, like you, you're, you're drunk, baby. You're inebriated. You, you are love drunk. And so the key is, The key is, is that when when that powerful beginning stage starts to wear off, you keep the flame flaming. You keep the flame flaming. You you, you wanna remain in this uh, state of, I still get butterflies for you, baby. You wanna remain in this state of, we still kiss, we still hold hands. We still snuggle. We still go on dates. We still send flowers. We, we still send cards. We, we, we write poems. I mean, infatuation's crazy. Even freaking men write poems. Men. And then we stop. So the key is to continue that, continue. If I want a happily ever after merit, I continue to kiss and hold and snuggle and hold hands and and hang out and send flowers and go on dates and and be intentional. I continue it, right? Because otherwise you're going to starve out that marriage. Uh, King Solomon, if you've never read the, 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 the book of the Song of Psalm, Song of Solomon, You can't read it unless you're 18. You're not permitted to read it unless you're 18 or over. 
But I'm going to read you a little bit. Solomon, he, he, he writes this romantic like poetry to, to his woman. This is what he says in chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. He says, you are beautiful, my darling. Beautiful beyond words. It's like we're seeing into somebody's romantic diary. Isn't this fun? Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. No idea what that means. Your hair, it falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. I mean, this is juicy. Your teeth are as white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Your smile is flawless. Each tooth matched with its twin. Come on, somebody. Thank God for nice teeth. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth, it's inviting. I mean, this is getting wild. Your cheeks are like rosy pomegranates behind your veil. Your neck is as beautiful as the Tower of David, <laughs> jeweled with shields of a thousand heroes. Your breasts are like two fawns, two fawns of a gazelle grazing among the lilies. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> You're altogether beautiful, my darling, beautiful in every way. Yeah, yeah, this is like, this is like, one of the most powerful, most wealthy men in the history of humanity. And he, he, he's writing poetry. He, he's writing th th this poem. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Men, men, men. Can you imagine like saying this stuff to your woman? I mean, could you imagine like your hair is like a flock of goats, babe? Like, dude. That's what I'm saying. Your teeth, they're as white. Like, I don't know, we, we would have to modernize it. You know, your teeth are as white as freshly shorn sheep is weird. Natalie would probably punch me. You know, I, I don't know. He, he says your neck's like the Tower of David. I, I don't know. My wife would probably be like, what? That, I don't know. Your breasts are like two fawns. Like, I... We have to modernize it, you know? I don't know. You, your teeth are as white. I don't even know what. Your teeth are as, babe, your teeth are as white as Taylor Swift fans. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't say it. The devil made me do it. I, I, I don't know, man. We got to modernize it, you know? Your neck is, I mean, I don't know, is a big, long, tall Tower of David neck like what we're looking for? <laughs> to modernize that, you know? Your breasts are like, you know, you all didn't think I was going to fill in the blank, but, you know, <laughs> something. You guys didn't know the Bible talks about this stuff, some of y'all. I mean, this is, what, this is what I'm saying. It's like, if, if, if you're married, keep the flame flaming. If you're married, be intentional. If you're married, date your mate. If you're married, date your mate. Not everybody's idea of a date is the same. It doesn't have to be like, oh, we go out every, I don't, it doesn't matter. Date your mate. For, I mean, forever, Natalie and I, forever, used to be like, we're going to have a date night once a week, a date lunch once a week. We did that forever. And life evolved, and we still date all the time, but, but we, we, we changed it. Now it's like once a month, we go on a weekend or a midweek getaway. Sometimes it's a staycation. I like that better than two hours on a Monday night because I get my girl all by myself. No distractions, no kids, no nobody. Although I run into some of you knuckleheads every now and then. But, but I, I, I want to say like date your mate. Show nonstop attention. Give nonstop affection. Hey, here's a question. When's the last time? You guys went on a date. When is the last time you guys went on a trip together? When is the last time you sent flowers or you wrote a nice note or you, 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 you sent a nice card? Keep the flame flaming. And by the way, that includes sex. 
Keep the flame flaming includes sex. Yeah, now that I got everybody's attention, let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about it. You and me, let's talk about it because the world's talking about sex. Did you notice that? And God's word also talks about sex. It, it, in fact, sex was God's idea. Sex was God's idea. God created sex. Sex is not bad. It's not dirty. We as humans made it bad and dirty. So sex is God's idea. And, 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 and I said that marriage is sacred, but the Bible also teaches us that sex is sacred. I want you to say those three words out loud. Sex is sa sacred. Ready? Here we go. Sex is sacred. Sex is sacred. So we've got social media and the internet and movies and music teaching your 10-year-olds about sex. Uh, teaching your 12-year-olds, your 14-year-olds. Listen, you, you parents and grandparents, we have a responsibility to teach them the truth about sex, okay? So sex is biblical. It's God's idea, and it's incredibly pure because it's sacred. Now understand, understand that sex is far more than a physical act. Okay, it is far more than a physical act. God created sex for intimacy. He created sex for unity. He created sex for enjoyment. And he created sex for procreation. Okay, if you are married, if you are married, <laughs> only if you are married, you ought to be having sex a lot. Okay, hold on, sir. Because I know ain't no woman over there clapping it like that. Not that, not that, no, not like that. If you're married, you ought to be having sex a lot. <laughs> In not, uh, let, me, let me read this scripture because this is out of Hebrews chapter 13, verse four. Honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between a wife and a husband. Let's read it out loud together. Here we go. Honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between a wife and a husband. Now, I understand that the entire world is telling us otherwise. I understand that the world is saying, no, no, you can have sex with whoever, whenever, however. See, see God's word says, it says that sex is created for marriage between a husband and a wife, and it is sacred. It doesn't say sex is created for one night stands. It doesn't say I created sex for the hookup culture. It doesn't say I created sex that you could go, you know, club around in South Scottsdale and then take somebody back to your place. It doesn't say that sex is to be taken lightly or flippantly or just given to whoever and however and, and whenever. God's word says that sex, it's sacred and it should be. In fact, let me say, it must be. It must be guarded. Look, look back at the scripture again. Look at it. Put it up again, please. Hebrews 13, 4. He says, honor marriage and, what does it say? And guard, and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. So he uses the word guarded. God's word says that sex should be, it must be 
guarded between a husband and a wife. Now, I know, I know, I know that many of us have screwed this up. No pun intended. (laughs) Many of you have screwed this up. Many of you are screwing (laughs) right now this up. I mean, not like right this second, hopefully, but. And listen, I'm not, hear me on this. If anybody wants to post an article or write something on me and post it, or if I end up on TV or something for say what I'm saying, so be it. But put it in context. I'm not here to judge. I, I, you know, I feel like when the woman was caught in adultery and brought to Jesus and Jesus, what should we do? In the Old Testament law said she should be stoned to death. You remember that story? Yeah, Jesus wasn't talking like, yeah, buy a bag of pot, dude, and get that woman high. She, he was talking about a death sentence, right? That's what the law said. And Jesus goes, he without sin cast the first stone. I have no stones to cast. I don't have a stone to cast. I, I'm not trying to make anybody feel ashamed or guilty. I'm not Pastor Darrison. That man's perfect. I, I'm not. I, I never was. Like, like, I'm trying to be like him. He thinks he's trying to be. I'm trying to be like him. Like, that man, right? Like, like he, he shared a story of how he ran out of the girl's house, like, you know, when he was in high school. Like, I, I didn't run out of no girl's house. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, like, praise God for Pastor Darrison to pull us all up. Like, like but all I'm saying, all, all I'm saying is that God, God loves us enough to call us higher. Now, and I also want to balance that. I wasn't no man hoe or anything like that. Don't get... Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but he says it's, it's reserved. It's reserved. It, it's for a husband and it's for a wife. It, 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 it's sacred. It's sacred. It's sacred. And so the, the, the word has a standard for sex, but the world, the world kind of has a standard too. The world's standard for sex is that there is no standard. It's, if it feels good, do it. That's, that's the world. Like, I don't know, sleep with whoever, whenever. Give it a, hey, give it a test drive. Try it out, man, right? So God's word calls us higher. And the word talks extensively about sex, In fact, if you're married, I got good news for you today. Well, at least for the men. The good news is that the Bible teaches us, if we're married, to never stop having sex. It says, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. I see some of you men getting a world smile on your face. It says, don't stop. Some of you men are like elbowing your woman. You know, it says... You said don't stop. And, and so I want to read this to you because it's, it's important scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 through 5, it says the marriage bed must be a place of mutual, mutuality, right? The husband seeking to satisfy his wife. I mean, there's a sermon that I can't really talk about on a Sunday. The wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision, which it is, to serve one another, which is what I talked about two weeks ago. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Verse 5, abstaining abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it. And if it's for the purposes of, I got a headache. Oh, wait, no, no, no. If it's for the purposes of prayer and fasting. But only for such times. Then come back together again 
Because Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. Hey, this is good stuff. This is like really, really good stuff. I'm glad that the word doesn't just like talk about like surface stuff. It talks about like real life living. It's talking about guidelines, principles, boundaries to make you happy, to make you live happily ever after, not to be a bummer, to make you happy, right? He says abstaining is permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it and if it's for the purposes of prayer and fasting, which is why Natalie and I don't pray or fast ever. (laughs) I'm just kidding. It's the idea of like keep the fan flaming and keep the the, the flame flame, flaming, keep the romance romancing, keep the attention attentioning, right? Keep the affection affectioning, Uh, keep keep the sex sexing. I I said this a a few a few weeks ago. I said, and you've heard it many times, but the but the the thing is, the grass isn't greener on the other side, right? I said the grass is greener where you water it and that the other side is artificial turf anyway. That's not even real. That's not even real, right? And so, so if you're busy watering your own grass, hey, hey, stop looking over the fence. If you're busy watering your own grass, if you're busy cultivating your own grass, you're not going to have time to compare your grass to the neighbor's grass. If I'm busy cultivating, see that's the problem is a lot of us, we cultivated in the beginning and then we stopped cultivating. Like what what does your spouse love? Serve them in that area. If you don't know, that's a whole different issue, right? My wife and I, we, we have different love languages. We have different intimacy languages. So the goal is I got to figure that out and serve her in that area for the rest of her life. She figures it out and serves me in those areas for the rest of my life. So my advice to you married couples is make your marriage grass look so green that everyone else's grass looks dead and brown. Create a magnet in your home. Create a magnet. Be magnetic, right? If you don't don't create the magnet, the devil's gonna pull you with a different magnet. Man, I didn't know I was gonna preach the whole sermon on sex today, but let's at least get one more. We might have to finish three and four next week and do even another week. But is this okay? This all right? Y'all digging into this? Okay, if you want a marriage that's happily ever after, number two, and I think we're just gonna do this one today. Number two is keep the communication Christ-like. If you're single, this is a great time to work on it. And and by the way, the longer you're single, the weirder you get. (laughs) You're like a homeschool kid, like. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Darrison's a homeschool kid too. He's No, he's not. I'm just picking on him. But keep the communication Christ like, you know, Jesus when you look at his communication, he communicated with truth. Hello? He com- he communicated with compassion with sympathy, with empathy, with consideration. Um, Psychologists tell us that uh, at least 85%, around 85% of people who come in for marriage counseling come because of communication problems. 85%. Communicate, bad communication, lack of communication, miscommunication. Happily ever after marriages, they're going to take Christ-like communication. And I got news for you. Healthy communication is tough. Christ-like communication 
is tough. You know why? Because every human speaks two different languages. And then you bring a woman and a man together and they speak two entirely different languages. I mean, they're not even close to the same. It's not like, you know, you, you speak English and she speaks Spanglish. Like you kinda, I get, no, no, uh-uh. It's like I speak Martian and, you know, she speaks from some other galaxy. Like, it, it's crazy. Communicate, you bring two people together that are even, even that are equally yoked and they're so radically different. You come from different backgrounds. You had different parents. Uh, some come from broken families. Some come, well, my parents are still married and they've, they, they, they've, they've hung in there through thick and thin. You come from different experiences. You come from different communication styles, social styles, different body language patterns, different habits. <laughs> With Natalie and I, we, com we communicate completely differently. If, if anybody knows us, you know that. We do not communicate the same. Like, one example is, she's very subtle. I'm not. I'm very direct. You know, uh, I, I'm kind of loud sometimes. She's not, ever, right? So like, we come together and she's subtle because she was raised with the mama who, who led in subtleties. I, read, I was raised by a mama who's like, Phew. direct, man. That, I don't, I don't like subtle. Natalie likes subtle because subtle is sweet. I don't like subtle because I don't know what the heck she's saying. It, it's sweet, but I'm like, what are you saying? Are you asking me to do something or no? Are you just telling me? Like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not good at guessing. So guess what? Over 26 years, 27 this March, We've learned some stuff. We're not perfect. We swing and miss on the daily. But I learned to communicate to her more subtly. And she communicates to me more direct. It's not the same. Right? It's just not this. I, it, it, it's the same in how we're trying to serve one another. But she's different than me. If I gave her what I want... It's going to slay her. If she gave me what she wants and how she is, it'd be a life of guessing games, right? And so that is true for every single one of us. It, we, we speak different languages. Not only do we speak different languages, we don't, we don't speak the same number of words every day, right? Studies show that women, 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 <laughs> well, let's start with men. Studies show that men speak about 20,000 words a day. I don't know about that. That's a lot of words. And, and how did they figure this out? Did they put like a clock on some dude's mouth? Like, and then studies show that women speak about 30,000 a day. There's a discrepancy. And if your marriage is anything like my marriage, by like 6 p.m., I've used all my words. Natalie's still got another 10,000. <laughs> and we got to be careful because whether it's 20,000 or 30,000, that's still a lot of words. In other words, we talk a lot. We talk a, a whole lot. And, and the Bible says this. You remember this scripture? It's Solomon again in Proverbs 10, 19. He says, when words are many, sin is not absent. Let's read it together. When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. Man, that's hard to do. And again, the world, the world teaches differently. 
The world's like, dude, if you got something to say, say it. You do you. Oh, you better, you better let him know. You better let her know. Right? That's what the world says. The world's like, you got to speak your peace. You got to speak your mind. No, 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 no. God's saying wisdom is controlling your mouth. Wisdom is speaking less words, not more words. We know this, that words are powerful. We know that. We know that. We know that Proverbs says that our words, they, they have the, the, the power of life and death. Right? It says it like this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So listen, some of you, some of us, we're killing our marriage with the weapon of our mouths. Maybe not even intentionally. It can be unintentional, right? Your words, they can destroy your marriage. They can destroy your family, your children, your career. Your own words can destroy your own reputation. And so the good news is the opposite, the opposite is also true, right? Our words can give life. Our words can give life. Our words can edify. Our words can build up. So if you're married and, hey, if you're single, start working on this right now. The Bible teaches us, encourage one another. Edify one another. Affirm one another. If you're married, every day, not sometimes, every day, tell her you love her. Listen, I don't understand. I don't understand. I really don't understand. I don't. I don't understand if you're married not telling each other, I love you, every day. It, Natalie and I, I I'm not going to exaggerate on this one. That probably happens, I don't know, 30 to 50 times a day between us physically telling each other or in a text message telling each other, right? I, I, I'm not saying the answer's that many or that little, but, but, but making sure that they know that you love them making sure like they know that they're appreciated, making sure that they know that you're proud of them, making sure no, nobody can make, there is not a drug in the world that can make me feel as high as I feel when Natalie encourages me, when she says, you look nice. When she says, man, that message really was incredible. Whatever it is, whatever the affirmation is, there's nothing in the world that makes me go, man, women, there's no drug in the world that will make your man feel more complete, fulfilled, satisfied, and that will, hey, all you gotta do is give him some love, some attention, some affirmation, and he will go conquer the freaking world for you. He will go conquer the world for you. I understand, it's like, it's like a cycle, right? You're like, well, if he actually was any of that, then I would tell him, and then, like, there's this cycle. We can get stuck in the vicious cycle. You know, break, break, break the cycle, break the cycle. You say, I don't feel like it. I don't care. Break the cycle. It, it was like 20 years ago and, and one of my mentors and, and uh, truly one of the greatest men of God I've ever gotten close to is a guy named Pastor Rick Warren. And he said this, I think it's even published in some books, but he said this statement. He said, it's easier to act your way into a feeling than it is to feel your way into an action. That's kind of cool and true. And it's not just true in the area of sex or intimacy. It's true in every area. I don't feel like forgiving them. Hey, newsflash, when you get hurt, nobody feels like forgiving. Nobody. Jesus is being crucified. And he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Like, man, we have to keep the communication Christ-like. And listen, maybe today, you just need to take a step out into faith and do it anyway. And watch feelings follow the actions. Do it anyway. We need to learn to communicate Christ-like. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 11, it says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. 
How about James 1.19? Man, this one, we love this one. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Let's read it out loud. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Quick to hear. Not just with my ears, but with my eyes. What do I mean by that? I mean, I want to listen with my heart. I want to feel what you're saying. I want to empathize with what you're saying. I want to be empathetic and sympathetic. So I'm quick. I'm quick to hear. I'm slow to speak, right? Slow to respond. Slow down to send that text message. Pray before you say. Slow the freak down. Like something you're like... Like your thumbs go into like turbo. (laughs) Slow down. The buffer is prayer. And he's a God, what? I'm pretty upset right now, God. I'm pretty, man, you know me, God. I've always had this little problem. Hey, listen, if y'all get close enough to PT, you, you, hey, you're not going to want to come up and meet me in the community. And you're not going to want a quick selfie or whatever and like... I'm fine with all that. I think it's weird, but I, I'm, I'm cool with all that. But if you get close enough to me, you wouldn't want any of that because you'd see how human I was. I get hot in a hurry. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's noticed that just in my preaching style. But like, I got to really protect everything about me because like I can go zero to 100 in like zero. Right? That's not godly. That's not Christ-like. That's not what a man of God would do. It's surely not what a pastor man of God would do. Right? And, and so he's saying, man, be, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Don't fly off the handle. One of the things I've learned in my own life is that anytime you lose it, you lost. You took a big L. Anytime you lose it, you took the L. So he says, be quick to hear. Be slow to speak. Be slow to anger. Man, this is good stuff, you guys. Don't be, don't be so easily offended. Holy moly. Can that go on CNN? Can that go on whatever news I know? Some of y'all think, oh, he's a Democrat. Can that go on Fox News? I don't, I'm a nothing crat. Like, I'm a Jesus crat. Like, I'm a Jesus again. I, I like, I, think, yeah, I don't, I don't care about being, I know there are churches that they're political and whatever. I'm not knocking them. I'm not, I'm not trying to be political. I'm trying to be biblical. I, I'm trying to t- teach God's word. I'm trying to teach his truth. Like, stop being so easily offended. Stop being so defensive, right? Stop, uh, stop assuming, right? Stop assuming, stop accusing. Don't assume, don't accuse, don't point the blame, don't point the blame, don't point the blame. Own your crap. Look at somebody and tell them you need to own your crap. Come on, own your crap, man. Own your crap, dudes. It's like one of the things that drives me the most crazy in life. Because, you know, we have like 50, I don't know, 50 full-time employees at Impact Church and a whole bunch more like part-time and then like a thousand volunteers. And like, there's a lot like, but like if one of my paid people, uh, you know, they, they, they don't whatever, they don't do something right, correctly, they don't show up on time, whatever, I don't care what it is, fill in the blank. The people that make excuses, by the way, when you make excuses, y'all know we can see right through that, right? And I, I, I just like somebody to go, I'm sorry I slept in. Just freaking be honest. Own your stuff. Own your stuff. Like, this is one of man's oldest stupidities. <laughs> Pointing blame, right? Pointing blame. Like, like Adam, did, what are you doing, buddy? And my wife... Eve, she made me do it. Like, she made you do it, brother. You mean to tell me that dainty little gorgeous woman 
shoved that thing in your mouth and chopped your jaws and jiggled your throat. <laughs> we don't like to because we feel too much shame. We feel too much guilt. We almost can't deal with it because we can't believe that we would do that either. Own it, right? Own it. Don't make excuses. Don't manipulate. Don't manipulate. Manipulation is lying. If you're manipulating to get something that you want, that's going to backfire on you. Because the Bible says that we reap what we sow. Right? Don't exaggerate. Exaggeration is lying. Like, speak truth, man. Speak gracefully. Speak gentle. This is for me. Speak gently. Kind. Right? Don't be harsh. Don't be rude. Right? Happily ever after. Women. <laughs> I got a couple verses for you, that's all. <laughs> Proverbs 27, 15 and 16. Don't nag. <laughs> a quarrelsome wife is as annoying as a constant dripping on a rainy day. <laughs> Stopping her complaints is like trying to stop the wind or trying to hold something with greased hands. I know you're like, I wouldn't nag if he would just. Vicious cycle. I'm not done. I said I got more verses. Proverbs 21, 9. Better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. <laughs> hey, you want me to modernize that? I'll be out in the garage, babe. <laughs> marriage is tough dude if you're single why are you in such a hurry <laughs> keep the fan flaming keep the communication Christ like and, 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 and we're going to make strides to living happily ever after it's 952 I got through two points so I'm going to save the next two for next week and would you do me a favor would you bow your heads with me? Let's close in prayer. God, we thank you for this great morning, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truths. God, thank you, God. You, you, call us, you call us up. God, you call us up. And God, we're grateful. Lord, today, I just pray that, uh, Lord, I pray for marriages in here today. I know there's so many broken marriages. There's so many marriages that are on the verge of divorce. Maybe they're just going through a, a, a real tough challenge right now. Lord, I pray that your peace would just cover their marriage. God, that your power would breathe life into their marriage. God, I pray that we would lead with truth and love, true love, biblical love. God, that we would be people that, God, you would give us the gift to be able to forgive even when we don't want to. God, that you would give us grace that is sufficient for us. God, that we would have strength when we are weak because you are our strength. God, today we're not perfect. Nobody in this building is. Nobody listening online is. But one thing we know is we serve a perfect God, a God who loves us, a God who forgives us, a God who gives us a second chance and a third chance and a fifth chance. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. You know, John 3, 17 says, for he did not come into the world to condemn the world. See, God is not a God of condemnation. He, he, he's a God of grace and love. And if you're here today, see, man, I'm, I've been messing this whole thing up. Listen, welcome to the the, the, the family of humanity. But we don't have to stay messed up. We don't have to stay there. We can take one step at a time towards the cross, towards humility, towards Jesus. So today, I want to encourage you today to take the step, whatever the step might be. Today, the step might be salvation. Today, the step might be, you know what? If I'm going to build my marriage 
on God, then I, I need to start with my own life. And today you say, man, today I wanna give my life to Jesus Christ. I wanna take a step of faith and become a Christian today. And if that's you, I want you to just do that. Right now, just pray from your own mouth, your own lips. Say, God, today I wanna become a Christian. Today I'm taking a first step toward you. I don't understand it all, but that's why it's called faith. And maybe you're here today and you need to take other steps. Listen, if you're, if you're married today, I wanna to encourage you. I wanna encourage, I want to strongly, strongly encourage you to get involved in our men's and women's Bible studies. They're starting right now. You can sign up online. Listen, I'm telling you, they will change your life. You need to be in the building for our men's and women's Bible studies. They're there as a tool to help you succeed, to help you win. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe your next step is starting to serve in the church. I don't know what it is, but listen, if you wanna grow spiritually like you have never grown before, it's time to join the Impact Church Dream Team and start serving. You will find friends and companionship like you have never even knew existed. So get plugged in. If you're a young adult today, get plugged in Thursday nights to our rally service. There's 800 college-age kids every Thursday night digging in, not standing around watching. They are digging in, pressing in under the incredible leadership of Pastors Darrison and Pastor Whitney. Man, we've got revival happening. So God, today we dedicate this day to you. God, we are honored to worship you, to love you, to serve you. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Impact Church, we all say amen. amen. God bless you guys. I love you. I hope you have a great week.